Good morning. There you are. Right, look, the market's up. We're going to be we're enjoying it today. Right, thank you for all coming along. We've got an awful lot to get through today. You have throughout the whole day, but we have as well in the next half an hour. I'm here with my colleague David Carroll, one of the co-founders with me of Seven Investment Management. And so today we're going to rattle through some key things here. David, you've got the clicker there. Let's get going with this. With the issues that we think you need to know now, the, the risks that there are, and some actions we think all of us need to be doing for running portfolios. David, where do we start? So I think there's, there's two aspects to the talk this morning. We're going to do a very quick whip round what we think is going on in markets. And then we're hopefully going to have one or two ideas about the sort of things that uh, investors should be thinking about and planning for. When you look at this in terms of 2016 and all the issues we've actually got on here, um, you couldn't make it up, could you? It's more like living in a Geoffrey Archer novel when you think about it. Obviously, all those things that weren't going to happen last year, like Brexit, Trump, and who on earth made Boris Johnson foreign secretary? The politics seems to have actually just turned the whole thing over. So now we need to try and actually work out how you do your investment despite all of that. Let's go on. So in the past year, you can see what's happened here. You all know the issues with regard to sterling, with regard to the politics. And of course, now inflation is rising. There's a whole generation of people coming through who have never seen inflation, as opposed to those of a certain age who may remember things like 20% inflation. And of course, the interest cycle has changed. US rates are going up. And as we sit here this morning, pretty much stock markets around the world are at all-time highs, certainly in the last week or so. Um, and again, as Justin said, who would have thought it with the po politics uh, and even the economic backdrop of last year being quite uncertain? You know, we go back to 12 months ago, and stock markets were going through one of their worst corrections in 15 years. It was amazing this time last year, wasn't it? Everything was out of fashion. It, it, it was indeed. I mean, you only have to look at the charts here that at the beginning of 2016, most stock markets were sharply lower. And yet, as we sit here today, stock market volatility is probably at its lowest for about 15 years. And what that's telling us is that at this moment in time, investors are pretty relaxed about the outlook. Um, there is an inverse relationship between stock markets rising and volatility falling, so that when stock markets fall, it co in, you, know, you, get, you get a rise in volatility. And you'll see that bottom line here, which is the orange line, which is the volatility of the FTSE 100 index. Uh, it's pretty much now at levels that we've not seen since uh, 2004, 2005. So that basically would imply that you know, over the next few weeks, months, whatever, we could be heading for another period of volatility. I mean, the reality of it is no one really knows what happens in no. the next three, six months. But I only have to look at a chart like this, particularly when it's a reasonable chunk of history, that it is inevitable there will be bouts of turbulence in markets. You only have to look at the chart to see every year there are spikes in volatility, periods when investors doubt the economic backdrop when they doubt whether or not uh, uh, economies are growing sufficiently. You know, last year we had three or four bouts of volatility that saw markets down by between 5 and 10%. Um, and I think it's only a question of time, frankly. Yes, you always said there's always, in a given year, there are always one or two gaps where the gates open when you can actually get in. Yeah, and the biggest challenge for any investors is actually to sit on your hands and do nothing. And patience is actually, for an investor, one of the most important facets to have. So just no need to rush with these sort of things. Let's move on to the next one. So in amongst all the, the political uncertainty out there, actually the economic backdrop's pretty good. Um, it's improved, despite the fact that the headlines maybe haven't told us that. And this chart here is simply that the economic growth of the 20 largest economies in the world, the G20, back since 1988. So it's a decent chunk of history. The red line is the average rate of growth in that time. And you'll see at that very right-hand side there, there's been a, a, quite a marked pickup in the last few months. So as we sit here today, global economies, we're expecting them to grow over 3% this year, um, which is a material improvement over where they were 18 months ago. And this, this is one of the reasons why markets have risen, because investors are anticipating better times ahead. And it is always rather depressing, isn't it, when you have to listen to Hugh Edwards on the 6 o'clock news droning on in a rather depressing way, uh, giving you the impression that we're actually doomed. Because when you look round and actually see the figures, this is the long-term average. So considering what happened in 2008, the largest financial explosion any of us have been through, and actually the global economy, a few years later, is now looking in pretty good shape. Let's have a look at the next one. So we see here, in terms of valuations rising since 2012 on, on that, that's the S&P and the FTSE, isn't it, overall? Yeah, so again, one of the commentaries that's out there is all markets are very expensive. Well, they are relative to some historic comparisons, but if uh, analyst forecasts are to be, uh, actually turn out to be true, if we continue to get a pickup in global economic growth, then these valuation levels will come down a bit and markets will be cheaper. But there's no doubt about it at this point in time, 
there's not a lot of margin of safety in the very short term in stock market valuations. Okay. This is quite an interesting slide here because this shows what analysts are currently expecting to happen with corporate earnings in the US. And the US is still the world's largest economy. It's the world's largest stock market. So generally what happens over there is very important for investors. And what we're seeing here is that analysts are expecting almost a 20% uptick in earnings for the calendar year of 2017. Um, which is one of the reasons, again, why markets have risen. If there's any sense that earnings aren't going to grow at the rate analysts expect, then you will get bouts of turbulence in markets. And it was interesting, actually, from really run about summer last year, wasn't it, when we started seeing the real impact coming through of that lower oil price impacting. It takes about 18 months to two years to come through, really. Yeah, and, and within these numbers here, the oil price is quite critical because one of the comparisons from 12 months ago is that oil companies in the US are going to go from making no money last oh. year to making billions of dollars again because the oil price has doubled. So actually, within this 20% uptick, there's about a third of it is probably due to the recovery in oil companies' That's revenues. Enough. Um, but actually, in the fourth quarter of last year, we saw something we've not seen for three, probably three, three and a half years, which is a sort of synchronized pickup in economic activity around the world, not only in the UK post-Brexit, but actually in the Eurozone as well. And if you think for the last seven or eight years, the Eurozone has been the sick, uh, the sick economy of the world. Um, and even you know, in the, in the fourth quarter, in the early numbers from 2017, we're seeing growth beginning to pick up in the, in the Eurozone as well. Now, of course, when you look at the world, there are the two key areas I think we have to concern ourselves. One is what's happening in China, the year of the rooster. And we still get people telling us that actually, well, the Chinese bubble is about to burst. Yes, there are lots of risks issue there, but actually that economy is still growing. I remember the BBC this time last year telling us actually oil imports are down by 40% in China. I think they had the graph the wrong way up. Uh, they were still growing. And of course, China is still growing. The great thing about the communist regime in China is their forecast data is absolutely spot on two years in advance. Of course, it's completely untrue, but it doesn't really matter. China is growing somewhere between 4 and 8%, which means almost certainly some's growing at 2 and some at 9. It's not stopping. So the rooster booster is going to carry on. Now, deal with Trump. Are we living in the phony war? Because remember, for the past few months, he's been promising everything and delivering nothing. And at this time, during the Obama regime, he already had over 20 bills going through Congress. Whereas, of course, young Mr. Mr. Trump currently has zero. And as of last night, couldn't even get the anti-Obamacare one through. So there's a certain amount of hope and expectation in that market at the moment. The question is, can he deliver it? So maybe that issue that, uh, that uh, David is talking about, maybe that might be the catalyst for maybe that pullback in volatility. Yeah, and the, the one thing to add to that is probably one of the biggest unknowns out there for investors is Donald Trump. We don't know the detail of his policies. We don't know how quickly he's going to be able no. to enact any of them. And therefore, we can't really forecast what the impact's going to be on the US economy. And that makes it actually really, really challenging. And mm. I think there are lots of potential opportunities for him to upset people uh, and for, again, to cause those bouts of volatility in markets. But again, if we look at some, some reasonably long-term data behind the scenes here, actually US consumer confidence it is, is at its highest for 12 years. He, there is still this sort of honeymoon period post Trump's election, which is feeding through to the real economy. The question is whether or not this, this uptick in confidence carries on through the summer. And remember, the US consumer is the largest driver of the US economy, 60 to 65% of the economy, over how I like to imagine it. Also, don't get too concerned with Trump. Remember, this constitution was set up so it could not be run by a despot. He can do certain things, but luckily, we've also got the judiciary and we've also got Congress. And with the great safety factor, you've also got Janet Yellen at the Fed, everyone's favorite granny. And she has got a hand on the interest rate decision, and thank heaven, there's actually giving some common sense there. But look at this with unemployment figures. Trump said US unemployment's in a terrible state. Really? Look at it. It's almost down to one of its lowest levels. Same with the UK. The UK's never had so many people employed. Um, and also, and David, you were pointing out about Europe as well. Yeah, and I think this is probably one of the most powerful pictures out there and probably explains why economic data globally around the world's improved. And that is European unemployment has fallen quite dramatically in the last 12 months. The Eurozone for years was lagging um, the recovery in the US and the UK. And finally, it appears to be coming back to life. Right. And again, the question is, can we see unemployment in the Eurozone get down to sort of eight and a half, eight percent or less, um, which will feed through to broader economic activity? Of course, here we are, nearly a year on, and we're still not quite sure what Brexit actually is going to consist of, hard, soft, or otherwise. We're going to have to pick our way through it. That actually is the danger for business, because it's not sure what it is. So short term, everything's fine. If you ask the longer term question, people are concerned. 
So whether it's a hard Brexit or do we end up with the dog's Brexit as to what's happening? We're just going to have to wait, work out and see what happens next. So with all of this, what's changed then in the United Kingdom in terms of all the issues we have to look at here? Certainly when you look at all of this, it's going to be change, of course, according to the negotiations. There'll be periods when suddenly there'll be a concern, well, maybe it's going to be a softer Brexit, and therefore you'll see a change in the value of the pound, or will it end up being harder? We just don't know at the moment. And for investors, to a great extent, you're going to have to start looking through some of this. So look at this. Probably the biggest variant you've got on your global portfolio at the moment, if you are living in Britain and you're a, a you know, UK investor, is sterling because you can be invested wonderfully around the world, sterling goes the wrong way, and you only have to look at what happened last year at Brexit. Unless you happen to be up throughout the night last year at Brexit, when sterling was at 149, 150, and of course Ladbrook said we were gonna stay in, and we all know the result, and sterling went to 125. Did you, were you able, or were your managers able to make sure you had covered that risk uh, over that time? And also the same applied to Trump as well. This variability is gonna be really important to your portfolios. And in the very short term, we probably expect to see the pound continue to remain weak. Um, the, the sense is that the early parts of the negotiations in, with Europe are going to be quite tough. Uh, and therefore, you know, the hard Brexit that markets have probably priced in remains the current outlook. If we get any sense that hard Brexit is going to be a lot softer than, than people think, then the pound could very quickly recover some ground. Um, but and in that, the very short term, we, we expect the pound to be a little bit weaker. And that's a key issue. One of the things we have done is actually we've actually put in a, uh, an option actually at 140, just in case the thing that's not likely to happen might just happen. After all, an awful lot of things that happened last year weren't expected to happen overall. So what else has changed? Well, we know the price of oil. And of course, that's affected key countries like obviously the Middle East, the drop we've seen there, obviously Russia. We should mention, I suppose, a bit about Russia, because the BBC gets terribly excited about Russia the entire time. You know, this superpower. Look, let's be clear. Russia is not a superpower. It's a dangerous power, not a superpower. Remember, its GDP is less than 45% of the GDP of the United Kingdom. And people at the BBC get very worked up about that chugging old aircraft carrier trying to get its way up the English Channel. Virtually had to be rowed back to St. Petersburg. And so put it into perspective. What other country would be stupid enough to actually put its budget at $115 to the barrel? Oh, yes, Mrs. Sturgeon in Scotland, uh, the cranky's love child, but that's another issue to deal with. US wages, UK wages, they're heading the right way. Um, they are, and for investors, these are quite important because one of the things that would appear to have changed in the last six months has been the outlook for inflation. Um, and the key drivers of inflation, certainly in the US, has been an increase in wages. US wage, wages are growing at their fastest rate for about nine years. And in the UK, we've finally seen some signs of wage growth uh, in, in the broader economy, both of which will feed through to inflation. And if you think about for the last six or seven years, we've, not, we've always been talking about low inflation. Well, we may have to get used to inflation being back at three, four or five percent before too long. Um, and that may mean that if inflation and wage rises then cross over again, we're in that position where people are starting to feel poorer. Now, be careful when you're dealing with inflation at the moment, because the traditional thing is go out and buy linkers and go and buy index-linked stuff. To remember, index-linked is index-linked with a bond. And if you think yields are rising, then the bond part of that will get affected. So they're afraid they're not just pure inflation-linked things. You have to find inflation-linked strips, separate types of investment, which is something we've been using. So you have to shop around to try and find those. So inflation is likely to rise further, as you can see here. Yeah, and our sense is that it may well peak over the summer. And again, I think one of the things to keep a close eye on is, is do we see this current surge in inflation around the world? Is it just a sort of one or two quarters of a spike? Or does it then subside and go back to sub 2%? Uh, it's going to be very, very interesting to see. Our sense is actually if wages continue to grow, then, then some of this inflation becomes embedded in the system. And, and there are indeed many commentators who will say inflation is heading to 10% or more, but we'll leave that for the... Which, which is quite something, isn't it? Says, yeah. But of course, the, the politicians quite like inflation, don't they? Because it actually erodes the debt we've built up. Well, so it's, the, it's the great unspoken tactic of the last seven or eight years, is they've been desperate to generate inflation. Um, in the view that it will shrink the amount of debt in the economy as people earn more, and it's the way to deal with all the debt. Because whether we like it or not, we have more debt now in global economies than we did in 2008. Uh, so very little of the debt has gone away. I think if you could ask any central bank, could they have two years of 6 or 7% inflation and then it subsides, they'd bite your hand off. They'd love it. No, no. 
So, key issues coming up. US rates, we heard from Janet Yellen that uh, at least two more rates are penciled in. Of course, that may change. Some are even talking about another rate rise in the States. Beyond that, we'll have to wait and see. But certainly, she's viewing, not just this year, but 18, 19, when does this actual economy start to turn down again? Because what Trump is doing, he's inherited a really successful economy. So, if he's extending that, if well, he's going to try and extend it. So yet Yellen's looking beyond it at such a stage when you can actually then start cutting those rates to try and actually support the economy. Of course, you can't cut the rates until you start raising them. So that's likely to continue. But those yields have been affected. Remember, as those yields rise, so as those uh, capital prices of those gilts and other bonds have been falling. And all those people that had those nice retirement portfolios of those lifetime structured portfolios, so when you retire, you have all those gilts, those aren't risk-free assets, those are riskier assets. What applied as being risk-free 10, 20 years ago is not the case anymore. So but if we go back six months ago, in the late summer of last year, you could buy a 10-year Eurozone government bond and you'd get a negative rate of return. You could buy a 10-year government gilt here in the UK and you'd earn 60 basis points. Interest rates have risen and they've started to rise quite dramatically. And when we talk about interest rates, this is the interbank market. This is the wholesale cost of money. This is where markets are predicting rates are going. And what's important about this for investors is that actually this, if it carries on, is a very significant sea change to probably the last 20 years of investing. Because if you look at this chart, this goes back to 1995. If I ran it back to 1980, it would still be the same pattern. Interest rates have been falling across the developed world from 10% in the, the late 80s to virtually zero now. And if we are starting to see them climb back to anywhere near 3 or 4%, that's quite a different backdrop for investing. And I think it provides savers with cash, a little bit of respite. We're not going to get there in a hurry, I should add. Um, but it does mean that when you come to make investment decisions, you're probably going to have to take some other factors into account. But your bond bull market of 25 years is now your bond bear market, in effect. Possibly it could be. It could be. And we've, again, we've got to wait very carefully over the next three and six months and just see, does that sort of uptick turn into be something more substantial? This is an interesting chart for savers, which we won't spend too much time on, other than to say it probably highlights something we all know, and that is that inflation has been running ahead of the risk-free rate of return of what you can get on deposit for some years now. And it looks like it's going to get worse if inflation picks up to 3 or 4%. That The Bank of England's caught in a very difficult position at the moment because they may not be too far away from wanting to put interest rates up, particularly if we get a slightly messy Brexit. Um, but they know that if they do, actually there's so much debt in the UK economy, it would be a massive headwind to growth. So in the very short term, maybe they do put that emergency rate cut of last summer back on. Maybe we see base rate go back to a half percent. But I don't think we expect base rate to get anywhere much above one percent for two or three years yet. But George Clooney, or Carney, or whatever he likes to call himself, certainly is actually focusing, now happy to move away from inflation and focus on growth, and almost say, I don't care about inflation quite so much, it's not such an issue. There you go, because they're desperate to get inflation. They don't want people to think it's such yeah. a big thing as it was maybe 10 years ago. <laughs> so what have we been doing at all of this then, to try and position the portfolios? As I said, but last year, we made sure very carefully we were controlling that currency issue, uh, particularly during the issues of, uh, of Brexit and with Trump as well. But overall, David, you just want to run us through some of these issues. I, I think, you know, for any investor, you know, you, you try to keep things as straightforward as possible. And, and really, last year was actually, as it turned out, reasonably straightforward. As, as the year went on, we took more out of risk assets as markets hit highs and became more and more defensive. So actually, as we sit here today, we've captured double-digit growth last year. Um, most investors would be happy with that, and we can just batten down the hatches. And I think that's where we are at the moment. I think a lot of multi-asset managers like us are relatively defensively positioned so that we have, you know, 40 to 50% in equities rather than 70 to 80%. But the idea of going back in when you see that opportunity for weakness? Yes, and, and you know, we've added in a couple of defensive uh, characteristics to portfolio, uh, adding some gilts in, we've added a little bit of gold. Again, these aren't, these aren't really complex things. Most people have done those in the last few months. But as we sit here today, we think the first half of the year is very much one of those periods of just to wait, wait and see and watch what unfolds rather than do anything too dramatic. I expect we'll be more active in the second half of the year. But longer term, you're still positive in terms of continuing to invest, but it's just a matter of waiting for the gaps to be able to get in. Yeah, I mean, our, our, our mantra for the last actually three or four years has been that actually the global economy is in reasonably okay shape. The problem is that markets are whipsawing around, the politics is getting harder to understand. Um, and we actually think we're not forecasting a recession. We think global economic activity will continue to improve. But as an investor, you know, 
your future return, if you like, is, is governed largely by the price you pay for the asset. Now, so, this, is, this bit here is, is David telling me, in terms of the housekeeping of my portfolio, what I should be doing, uh, as he does with all his clients. Just those things, particularly as you're coming up to the end of the tax year, getting things well organized. This is your sort of household list, isn't it? Yeah, there's, there's some really basic habits that I think, you know, as we accumulate wealth and we get more involved in investing, we tend to kind of think about, we forget about some of the basics, when actually these are really important. You know, I, w I would say to everyone, you should at least once a year write down your balance sheet. What are your assets and liabilities? You know, actually have a good handle on what your income and expenditure is. These might sound like really basic things, but if you don't do that, it's very hard to come up with an appropriate investment strategy for the future. You know, there are some very simple tax efficiencies everyone should use. You know, the ISA allowance goes up to £20,000 next year. Um, you know, I would encourage everyone to start funding their ISAs early in the tax year rather than at the end if they possibly can. You know, we have a, uh, you know, for capital gains tax here in the UK, we have a very competitive tax structure. Um, you know, 10% capital gains tax for basic rate taxpayers, 20% for higher rate. You know, if people were, were, were being offered 20% income tax rates, they jump at the chance. So don't forget to use those allowances. Um, and we also shouldn't forget pension contributions. I know that the pension rules have been messed around with over the years, but you know, every little bit you put back into a pension, you get tax relief on currently. Um, and for those that have defined benefit pension schemes, you know, some of the transfer values that have been quoted out there are just, you know, they've 30 times annual pension. I mean, some of the ones I've seen coming out of the Barclays ones have been absolutely eye-watering, um, quite astonishing. They just want to get out of it, don't they? And again, it's, it's funny, if you look at the chart of all-time lows of government bond yields. Yeah. That's what's driving a lot of these defined benefit pension schemes to say, look, we can no longer afford the liabilities based on where interest rates so are today. get me out at any price. So they're offering people ridiculous transfer levels. Now, the challenge is for most people, they probably shouldn't come out of the scheme. Um, but again, if you have a defined benefit scheme, it is, it is a, a timely thing to go and just get it reviewed and make sure it remains fit for, for, for your purposes. Okay, so what should investors be doing now? Stock market's all-time high. Do you sit there, it's obviously not buying immediately. What now? I think there's lots, lots for people to do. I think you just have to use this time to make sure that you really understand what have you got in your portfolio? What's it there to do for you? Um, I think every portfolio invest that investors have always has one or two things. They think, mm, do I really still want to be holding that? Use the market highs to tidy things up. Because if things aren't working now, I'm not sure they're going to work because it doesn't get much better than the, than the backdrop possibly that we've had. So take some profits in that? Can be. Why not? Or just, you know, if you've got investments that are working, make sure that, you know, you understand what they're doing. Put more money with them. Okay. Um, I think it's very important to have a plan. Make sure you understand where your capital's invested and, and what is its purpose for you. Um, and I think the critical thing, because people are still accumulating money and want to invest, is go back to basics. If you have money to invest, there's no harm in investing it in stages. And just say, right, if I've got £20,000 to invest, I'm going to invest £2,000 a month for the next 10 months. And you know what? I'm pretty confident that if you did that, you would get some in invested during the low points You'll in any market turbulence, yeah. rather than sitting there thinking, I've got to invest, I'm paralyzed with fear. I think if you do a little bit of investing and do it in a mechanistic way, you'll, um, you'll, you'll get some good outcomes. Now, you've got a couple of slides here just to highlight the difference of the indices. Because, of course, uh, we get, again, old Hugh Edwards telling us the FTSE 100 the entire time, which, first of all, doesn't actually reflect the UK economy anyway. But also, as an index, it's a bit limited, isn't it? It just shows it looks like a roller coaster the entire yeah, time. Yeah, no, it does completely. And this is, this is the FTSE 100 index that every newspaper or journalist quotes. And you'll see that it's up at a high there of about 7,300. But the reality of it is it is only half the story. Um, and actually what investors should be looking at is this graph, which is the same underlying companies, it's the FTSE 100 index, but on a total return basis. So it includes the dividends the companies pay out. And actually if you are an investor who is long term, you're more interested in this than you are in the former. And what this simply tells you, because it's the same period of time, it's the same scale, that actually the market dips tend to be less prolonged. Uh, and actually quite often, Markets are, are, are hitting all-time highs pretty much every, every other year because you've got the benefits of the distributions from companies, and if you reinvest them, you get the benefit of compounding. This is really basic stuff, but I think but it just is a good, good bit of context. I remember those figures from the old Barclays Equity Guilt study, but they still apply now. I think it was if Granny left you £100 71 years ago and put it in the FTSE, uh, you would end up with about £9,000. 
Granny did the same thing, but this time invested in the FTSE, but reinvested the dividends. And it wasn't £9,000, it was £189,000. So all those tedious dividends, you know, those little tuppenny bits, actually compounding over time. We, we all know it, don't we? But why don't we teach this to people at school? Why don't we teach people personal finance at school? We're barely doing it. It's something we've got to be able to do. Otherwise, we're ignorant. Exactly, and if you go back to the, the previous slide about the fact we have actually quite a good capital gains tax regime at the moment in the UK. You know, if you're reinvesting dividends and it's accumulating up in a portfolio, actually take the capital gains. Yeah. You pay less tax than you would income tax. I mean, it's, it's not going to be like that forever, but it makes sense to, to, to reinvest the dividends. Now, I wanted to show you one thing, because David talked about planning. To me, this is crucial. There's a corny old line. If you're planning to invest, don't. That's it. That's all of us out of a job. Invest in planning. You wouldn't set up a business without a business plan, a cash flow, a balance sheet. And yet most of us, when we're doing our day-to-day -day work, don't plan anything at all. It's almost on the hoof, or that seems like a good idea. What we've got here is actually an app which was designed by some of our clients. They were software geeks. They wrote Donkey Kong and GoldenEye and things like that. And they didn't understand what we were telling them in terms of the reports, in terms of what was online. So they've written an app of actually what happens to the portfolio, you know, where you're invested in the globe and things like that, and how it breaks apart. But more to the point, this thing here, it's a cash flow planner. You put in your information as a software game. It tells you when you're going to die. Don't worry, you can change your death. More to the point, you can change other people's deaths. You don't have to tell them. And therefore, it just tells you when the money runs out. Tell me now. Don't tell me when it's about to happen. That's the whole idea of this. It's a really simple app. It doesn't cost you anything at all. You can download it. If you go to our stand, you can actually go and find some details on how to access it. And just don't worry, it has no connection to us. You can just actually feed information in. It tells you data. So hopefully, that's our view of what's happening. That's our housekeeping ideas of what David is doing for me and also for the rest of our clients. And hopefully, that's something you can use which doesn't cost you anything. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great day today. And thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.